Welcome to Crossroads Online. My name is Jonathan, and it's so great to have you worshiping with us today online. And before we get started, we'd love for you to just take a moment and share this service with a friend or family member. Just you can send them the link or share the video on Facebook. And we'd also love to hear from you. On the Crossroads app, you can let us know uh, that you're here by filling out our communicator card. You can tell us how we can be praying for you this week and any ways that you might like to get connected at Crossroads. Let's start with worshiping God together. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. The man's empty praise, treasures the faith are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Nothing is better than you. And I'm not. 
Coming up April 30th and May 1st, we are very excited to announce our first ever Ignite conference. We plan to make this an annual event, and this is really to live into the saying we've been using that as the church, we are the family of God on the mission of God. That's what this whole conference is about. And you're gonna be inspired by Rob Wegner, who is the founder of what's known as the Kansas City Underground. And Rob is really a great teacher at how we can be everyday missionaries in very approachable, practical ways. I've personally got a lot out of his insights, and so you're gonna be empowered by him. He's gonna inspire you. You will be surprised at how ready you'll feel for God to use you in your neighborhood, in your workplace, in your school, wherever you are, that's where God wants to use you. And so uh, there's gonna be not just Rob speaking, but a bunch of breakout sessions from our Crossroads family. And you can register for this on our website, xr.church ignite, or you can also do so on the Crossroads app. Hi, my name's Liana. Um, I've been a crossroader for about six years now. So a few years ago, I started to not feel well. And at this point I had a business. I was a personal trainer and nutrition consultant and I was working and I was working out. And during those times, I just felt this fatigue setting in and I started to not feel well. I'd find myself in bed uh, pretty frequently and slowly but surely that escalated. And within a matter of months, I was not really functioning um, well anymore in any area of my life. It was very difficult to work. I couldn't work out anymore. I didn't have a social life because I took all of the energy that I had just to get up and go to work. Uh, and so I started to visit doctors and nobody could find anything. And after about eight months of exploring, I finally got a diagnosis, something called mold illness, which not a lot of people know about. It's chronic inflammatory response syndrome, as well as multiple chemical sensitivity. Um, I was also diagnosed with Lyme, and so there are a lot of co-infections and different things that I was battling all at once. I just remember this moment. I couldn't get out of bed and I needed to get a shower and get to work, and I needed to get in the shower to get to work, and I was just like fighting so hard to get out of bed. And I got myself into the bathroom, and I was on my knees on the bathroom floor, and I couldn't get in the shower. And so it was that moment, and I just, literally got onto my knees and I just cried out to the Lord. I said, Lord, you have to help me. I can't do this on my own, um, I need you. That very night I got um, information that I could no longer be in my, uh, where I lived, I could no longer live in my apartment. And so I packed a bag with pajamas, a toothbrush and my cat and I left and I never went back. From that point, I lost my studio where I worked because I could not be in that environment. So overall I lost my health, I lost my job, I lost my business, I lost my income, I lost my possessions, I lost my sense of purpose, passion, and I also lost my independence. Um, at 30 years old, I had to move in with my parents. I had been gone for 12 years. You know, I did a lot of praying through these hard times. I had a whole lot of time to pray. When you're down and out, man, you get to sit there and really dig into prayer. And it was about a year ago when I realized, I'm praying a lot, but am I listening? Am I acting? Am I doing more than just sitting there and praying? There was a very specific moment where I knew, like, man, I need to listen for him. I need to act on what he's prompting me to do. And I think that was a really big turning point. That was the moment where it was like, okay, I hear you, God. Here's where you want me. Here's what you want me to be doing. And. As hard as it is to see sometimes, there's so much good in my situation and what's happened because I'm exactly where God wanted me to be. I wanted my life to look this way. I wanted all those things. And yeah, there's parts of it I still do. But when I leaned into God and what He wanted for my life, it was just like, I don't know, He just released all of that, all of the things that I was holding on to, the, the sadness, the anger, the fear, um, and just instilled a peace in me that's like, Hey, I got you. Like, I got this. You don't have to. I'm not 100% where I want to be. Uh, you know, my health isn't fully back to where I want to be. I'm not working yet. I don't have an income yet, but I am slowly gaining back um, certain pieces. So I'll finally have my independence back. Bought a house a couple months ago, just moved in four weeks ago. And um, 
God provided every step of the way. Environments are the one thing that's the most challenging for me to be in. And he opened every door to allow me to be able to buy this home and live in it. After about a year of volunteering at Crossroads and We're In, I recently became the Connections Director. I'm helping people connect into life groups, which I think is one of the most powerful things. Um, just that space to connect and be vulnerable. Um, I know that my life group was essential in helping me during my darkest times. And so it's really awesome to be on this side of it, just helping people get connected with one another, um, grow in their faith, grow within themselves. So when you lose your health and your independence and your job and all of those things, um, you're not left with much, but I was always left with Jesus. He met me there every step of the way. I felt alone so many times, like just genuinely, like I am alone in this. No one gets it, nobody understands it, no one's in it with me. And in those moments where I'm alone and I'm laying in bed and I feel sick and I'm mentally and emotionally drained and I have nothing left in me, Jesus met me there. There was a moment where I realized like, yeah, I've surrendered my life to Jesus but I haven't really surrendered fully to his plan and purpose for my life. And I think it's in those moments where he met me in my darkest places and my times where I was so lonely. And he is what brought back in the hope that there's more out there. There's more for me. I don't need all of these things. I just need Jesus. So as followers of Jesus, our generosity is an act of obedience and worship to God as we give to him a bit of what he has given to us. And our giving is also what fuels our mission to make disciples and to see God's kingdom furthered through this re region. Uh, the easiest and safest way to give is online at xr.church give. You can also mail a check to the address that's on your screen. But before we give, uh, would you join me in praying this together? Holy Father, there's nothing that I have that you have not given me. All I have and am belong to you. To spend everything on myself and to give without sacrifice is the way of the world. But generosity is the way of those who call Christ their Lord, who love with free hearts and serve him with renewed minds. I'm determined to increase in generosity until it can be said that there is no needy person among us. I'm determined to be trustworthy with such a little thing as money that you may trust me with true riches. Above all, I am determined to be generous because of you, Father, are generous. It is the delight of your daughters and sons to share your traits and to show what you are like to all the world. Amen. Let's continue worshiping God now through singing and giving. Shit. 
sing it out this is what living looks like this is what freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we praise you this is what living looks like this is what freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we praise you this is what living looks like this is what freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we praise you this is what living looks like this is what freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we praise we'll see you break down every wall we'll watch the giants fall fear cannot survive when we praise you the god of breakthrough Psalm 42 is a beautiful prayer of lament. And so I would just invite for you to bring to God as we read this psalm, whatever those things that you're mourning or grieving right now, place those in God's hands as we read this together. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the Mighty One, with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him my Savior, and my God. Let's pray together. God, as we sit here in your presence, we know that you have every need of ours in mind and that your Spirit is already interceding for us. God, we know that um, in our grief, in our pain, whatever those are right now, that you stand in those things with us and that you are for us. We pray for a sense of your nearness. We pray for a sense of your revelation that you would speak to our hearts in the midst of the trials and the difficulties that we face. We know that you are faithful to us. And so we just pray that you would give us the strength to be faithful to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hello, my name is Rachel Swihart, and I'm regional pastor of our Weirin, Ohio Valley region. I'm so glad you are joining us today. I hope you're in a good mood because I'm in a good mood lately. It's spring, the trees are blossoming. I love seeing the flowers on the trees. There's warmer weather, feeling the sunshine. I've noticed more hope is in the air too. People are starting to feel hopeful that we are coming to the end of COVID. Although it's not over with yet, but more and more people are getting vaccinated and people are beginning to think about what life after COVID might look like. I even have airline tickets, so we have a vacation planned. And I don't know about you, but that feels so freeing to be able to fly and hit the skies and to get away. And so I'm in a good mood today. But over the last year, I honestly can say that I had some real down moments. That's the way moods work. They go up and down, especially during COVID. Some days we feel hopeful, other days not so much. So today I want to talk to you about how we can maintain hope amidst all the changes and challenges of life. I'll be reading in Psalm 42 today, so if you'd like to join with me and get your Bible, I'll meet you there. Psalm 42 was written by David, Israel's greatest king. It was meant to be put to music. It's like song lyrics. And this would have been a sad song because David wrote this when struggling emotionally. He had lost hope and was depressed. We pick up here in verse 3. My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, where is your God? Have you ever felt like David did? Maybe you know what it's like to be on a diet of tears, or at least to lose the joy of life, when you don't feel like doing anything, even the things you've enjoyed in the past. You wonder what difference it makes whether you try or not, it's hard to envision a better future. David felt that way, and the people around David were asking him, where is your God? When you're struggling emotionally, sometimes people with good intentions try to snap us out of it by saying, aren't you a Christian? Where's your faith? Small confession here. I've actually said this to someone struggling. I meant well, but now I know to respond differently. There was a time when I assumed a true believer would never get down or depressed, but that is just not the case. Throughout history, we see godly people fall into periods of depression. The Old Testament tells us that David and the prophet Elijah got depressed. Great leaders of the church like Martin Luther and C.S. Lewis battled depression. So did a famous hymn writer named William Cowper. Some years ago, speaker and writer Carlos Whitaker posted a picture of his, of his medication bottle, revealing that he had struggled with depression and anxiety for 10 years. And for him, a Paxil a day keeps the doctor away. Charles Spurgeon was one of history's greatest preachers. He lived in the 1800s, and huge crowds would come to hear him talk about Jesus, and they would put their faith in Jesus. But he also wrestled with depression. Spurgeon was quoted as saying, Depression is not a virtue. I believe it is a vice. I am heartily ashamed of myself for falling into it, but I am sure there is no remedy for it like a holy faith in God. Too often, there's a stigma that surrounds depression, particularly chemical depression or major depressive disorders. This causes people to hide what they are going through from other believers and even hide from God at times. It prevents people who are struggling from coming forward and asking for help or even revealing how God is working in their lives. But David didn't hide that he was depressed, and he also reveals what he did to regain hope. We pick up here in verse 5. David says, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. David is preaching to himself, why are you downcast? He, he tells himself, put your hope in God. This is so important that he ends the psalm by reminding himself of this, repeating the same words. Verse 11, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. David shows us that the first step in regaining our hope is to talk to ourselves and tell ourselves God's truth. That's because our hope rises or falls depending on the voices we listen to. We each have an inner voice narrating as we go through the day. It's an inner voice that only we can hear. That voice is either strengthening our hope or weakening our hope. Sometimes the inner voice we are listening to is our own. In verse 9, David writes, I say, 
I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? Who told David that God had forgotten him? David. He, David's the one saying, why have you forgotten me? He's going through his day telling himself that God doesn't see what's going on, that God, God doesn't care about him anymore, that God has forgotten about him. Now, is that true? No, but that's the inner narration he has going on in his head. He says, I have to live oppressed by my enemies. Is that what God told him? No, that is what David told himself. If we're feeling hopeless, we're probably talking to ourselves in a hopeless way. You know those sayings, you'll never be able to succeed. You'll always messed up when it really counted. No one will ever love you for who you are. You'll never change. Can you relate? When we listen to our fears, we grow fearful and lose hope. When we replay our past failures, we lose hope for the future. Other times the voices we are listening to in our heads belong to others. David had enemies who wanted to bring him down, and David heard what they were saying about him. Verse 10, he says, My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, Where is your God? David could quote what his critics had said. He had memorized their mocking words. They echoed in his head. No wonder he was depressed. To have negative words stuck with you, sometimes other people's words can stick in our memories for years. We not only remember playground insults or our parents' angry words, we replay them in our minds over and over. But those are not from God. If we constantly listen to them, we will drain our hope and stoke our fears. We need to remember that just because we feel something doesn't mean it's real. It could just be an echo from the past. Many people are getting the vaccination, and I've been kind of fascinated by hearing how different people react to the shots. Some have symptoms, some don't. A friend of mine got her second vaccination shot a few days ago. She had a few side effects. She felt tired and achy. She felt very real symptoms of COVID, though she didn't have COVID. They were just side effects of the vaccine and they went away. You might have symptoms of having no future different than this moment right now, but that might be after effects, echoes of other voices. Just because you feel anxious doesn't mean that something is wrong. Just because you feel down doesn't mean that your life isn't without meaning or that you have no future. God says you have a future. God says you are precious to him. That is what is true. That is what is real. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, don't listen to yourself, preach to yourself. Don't let the voices in your mind go unedited. Replace them with God's truth. That's what David did. He told himself in verse 5, Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. David was preaching hope to himself, and we can do the same thing. Here are a few lines you can preach and preach them to yourself. God has blessed me. Verse 6 says, my soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. David was down, so he chose to remember God from the mountaintops that God had given Israel. He was remembering how God had blessed him in the past. Recently, a crossroader had been going through a very hard time. Her husband died, and she had severe financial problems. There was family tensions. She also had serious health issues and couldn't leave the house for most of the past year because of her immune system. But during a phone call, all she could do was talk about how thankful she was for all the ways God had blessed her and how much she loved her friends. She wanted to help other people and she looked forward to returning to church when her health allowed it. Stories like that inspire me. They touch my soul deeply. It makes me think of all the amazing ways that I have been blessed too. Too many to count. Some are, my, my son Nathan almost died at birth and then we struggled to get pregnant again and now I have two healthy, beautiful children. I had a tumor behind my eye that took dozens of different surgeries and procedures and years to finally be healed. And God has blessed me with a new life. What do I have to complain about? And that is true for each of us who follow Jesus. Maybe you didn't have surgery or struggle to have a baby, but the Bible says we were dead in our sins, but Christ made us alive in our spirits and that we live eternally with him. Talk about a blessing. Let's all preach this truth out loud together. Say it with me out loud. God has blessed me. Here's another hope-building truth to preach to ourselves. 
God is with me. David sometimes felt like God had forgotten him, but later he realized that that wasn't true. He says in verse 8, By day the Lord directs his love, and night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. David is focusing on God's truth that God loves him. He focused on the truth that God is present. His song is with him, and God is with us too. Jesus said, I will never leave or forsake you. And our hope will grow when we don't just tell ourselves that, but also act on that truth. David didn't just tell himself that God was with him. He also chose to put himself in a position to experience the presence of God personally. Psalm 42 mentions two ways David put himself under God's faucet, two practices that will build our hope. First, David worshiped with others. Verse 4 says, These things I remember as I pour out my soul. I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the Mighty One with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. There are a few times that I felt down about worshiping this past year with COVID. Easter 2020 was especially hard for myself. I remembered the good times of Christmas and and Easter services of the past where they were packed full of people and energy, and I longed for that again. When we regathered, I was reminded that the Holy Spirit works in a special way when Jesus' people gather in his name and worship him together. I saw faith being released in people. The power of God is present to heal, and Jesus is in the midst of us. We need to worship with others because ultimately, worship is not something we watch. It's something we do. And we were created to worship with others. Worship is a rehearsal for heaven where we will be gathered with countless others before the throne of God. I am convinced that God is doing his work among his church and crossroads. He is doing a new thing. He didn't cause COVID, but he will use it to refine us and lead us towards his purpose. And we can be stronger, a more renewed church that looks even more like the early church, which was a movement of house churches. David valued gathering with God's people, and that will help us experience the presence of God so that we know he is with us. A second practice of David was to seek God privately. Verse 1, the beginning of the psalm, it starts out as, As the deer pants for streams of water, so, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? David wanted more of God's presence so deeply that he compared it to panting and thirst. Thirst is powerful. The book Sahara Unveiled tells the story of an Algerian named Laglag and a companion whose truck broke down while crossing the desert. They nearly died of thirst during three weeks as they waited to be rescued. As their bodies dehydrated, they became willing to drink anything in hopes of quenching the terrible thirst. The sun forced them into the shade under the truck where they dug a shallow trench and they laid there day after day. They had food but did not eat it. They were afraid it would magnify their thirst. Those who are lost in the desert don't die of starvation. They die of dehydration. And thirst is the most terrible of all human sufferings. When sustained extreme thirst sets in, people will drink anything. Laglag and his friends started to drink rusty water out of the truck's radiator. Their thirst was so bad and they were so desperate, they were willing to drink what was essentially poison. When we get disconnected from God's presence, our souls become thirsty. They lose hope. We may not understand what's happening or what we really crave, but we can't live with a thirsty soul. So if we don't turn to God, we will turn to other things to quench our soul's thirst. We will be drawn to things like money, sex, power, and control. And we may not even understand why. At a soul level, we think they will fill our inner needs. Unfortunately, those thirst quenchers are actually spiritual poison, a dangerous substitute for the living water of God. They might seem better than nothing at first, but they end up hurting us more than they help. The answer is to seek God's presence in a personal way. God is with us, so let's press in through public and private worship. When we connect with God's presence, He will restore and maintain our hope even in difficult situations. So let's preach this truth together. Um, Let's say this out loud. God is with me. And as we close, I want to encourage you, wherever you are, to stand up and to say these last verses of Psalm 42 aloud together. Say them with me. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him 
my Savior, and my God. Let me pray for you. Father God, I thank you that you have revealed to us David's pain, that he suffered depression, that he had down times. But God, just like you did for David, we are trusting that you will lift our spirits, that you will heal the hurt, and that you'll bring us hope in the challenge. God, I pray for all of those right now that might be taking in thirst quenchers as they're thirsty for the living God. God, reveal to those false false uh, drinks, God. Reveal those false drinks to us, Father God. And I pray that we would turn and drink living water from you, God. And that Jesus would restore our souls. That we would praise you. And that we would worship you all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name. Days may be darkest, but your light is greater. You light our way, God, you light our way. When evil is rising, you're rising higher with power to save, with power to save. You keep hope alive. You keep hope alive. We would love to pray for you. And so you can message us on our Facebook page or click live chat on our xr.church page. Thank you for joining us, spending time with us. We are praying for you and you are sent with love and power to be the church who makes disciples who makes disciples.